Our scripture today comes from John 14, 23 through 31. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise and let us be on our way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. seated. Amen. Amen. I, as we continue in uh, the Gospel of John over the past uh, uh, three or four weeks of sermons, I, it's been a lot about love and grace and, 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 and mercy and how God loves us unconditionally. And, uh, but I, I just want to remind you, it's been, it's been uh, uh, the Lord's been dealing with me about that. In no way uh, do I condone sin. The wages of sin is still death, and the wages of sin is still destruction, and it, it brings so much discord and uh, destruction in our lives, both our personal lives and the lives of our communities uh, around, the, around the country. So uh, in no way, my, my contention is, however, that if, if you live a life before a person that is grace, and it's not condemnation, but the Spirit of God brings conviction upon our lives. Conviction draws us toward God. Condemnation repels us from God. So I just, uh, I'll just remind you in the, in the midst of all of this, these great love chapters and the grace of God that their sin, the sin is still very destructive. And in no way do I condone that. I just felt like I needed to, needed to clear that up and to say that, uh, uh, that we live in a world that's uh, mixed up. We live in a world that is, that is uh, hurting. As we continue in this, uh, essentially, Jesus' farewell text, as he's given his disciples his final instructions, as he's be, uh, beginning to face the cross, and, and the main thing that he's saying here, that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So the first thing we need to understand, I guess, is, is what does that mean? What does that look like? What kind of love is he talking about? And here is where the context of the situation is so important for us to understand. Jesus is about to leave. So the question he has on his mind, I'm sure, is can these disciples continue loving me even after I'm not there, even without my physical presence? Will the next generation love him without having seen him? Will the next generation, all the way down to us, have a relationship with Jesus and him not being physically present? Jesus is declaring, yes, you can. You can have a relationship. You can love me, but not in the way that the disciples imagined that it could happen. It's not clinging, not by clinging to a cherished memory, much like we would hold up some president or some great world leader that accomplished great things and remember those things, but long gone, or not by retreating into another world and kind of enclosing yourself in some kind of a monastery Top experience, not at all. It's that, and so that you might relish in your private experience. It's not a private experience at all. It's very public. They continue to love Jesus by continuing to do the works that Jesus has has uh, called us to do by keeping His commandments. And there's not a person in this room does not feel that or know that when you've ministered to somebody and that little child will come up and say thank you 
or that, that person that you visited that was lonely, that you took that apple pie to, and the smile comes on their face, and this well of, 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 of euphoria, as the best I can describe it, comes up within you. Do, we know, do you know what I mean by that? There's that good feeling when you know that you have ministered to somebody along the way. So Jesus knows that his love continues in us if we simply continue loving people around us. He's saying to us, that by moving outside of our private experience, that you begin to experience who Jesus is, that you begin to live out what Jesus has taught, you begin to live out the, de the demonstration of his life that he has shown us and give us the example for, then, once again, they will find themselves in love with God. Bishop Tom Bickerton wrote a book just fairly recently. The name of it is What Are We Fighting For?, and I got it about two weeks ago, maybe, maybe three. And he was telling about a beloved seminary professor in his book. And, and uh, his name was Kenneth Goodson. He was also a United Methodist, Methodist bishop. Bishop Goodson served as a teacher and a, a mentor to Tom Bickerton for several years. And the bishop was on his deathbed. And he stated to Tom, he said, Tom, the worst thing is my health has declined is being that, that I, I, I just can't preach anymore. And that's very difficult for me. And Tom spoke up and said, Bishop, for the first time in our experience together, I'm going to disagree with you because every time I get in the pulpit, you're preaching through me. As long as I breathe, you'll be preaching the Word of God. That's exactly how the gospel is perpetuated throughout eternity to the next generation. That's why, that's why in this church you see so much effort put in to, to our young people, to our children, to, to all the ministries that take place for them because the fact is they're taking our place as we speak. They're taking over the church that you took over from your grandparents and parents. They're moving into the place you are. Jesus is mapping the way for us to, have to, to continue his life his ministry long after he's gone. Jesus lived out God's love by keeping his commandments, by making God known to the world, by making known the promise of salvation, that there's hope in the midst of this chaos, and by living fully and freely, even to the point that he laid down his own life. And Jesus' love is not a private affair. It's not some mystical experience. In fact, it was a very public experience all the way from the manger to the cross. From his very first uh, incarnation, Jesus began to live out that love of God through his life. And so the exact opposite took place. It was a very public experience. And it was repeated over and over and over throughout his ministry, through his whole lifetime. So our, our worship and our exaltation of Jesus up to this point is the point. In other words, his works simply, simply uh, were meant to bring glory to God. And you know, I've, I've found in my experience that, that, when, that when we get out of ourselves and we do for the other and we're working toward a common goal and, and it's not about, you know, somebody said once it's an amazing thing about what can get accomplished if everybody works together and don't care who gets the credit. Can you imagine the kind of world we would live in in that way? When disciples of Jesus follow this model of love and relationship, we're able, we're able to move past and continue on past the first generation into every generation, including ours. So therefore, our relationship with Jesus does not depend upon his physical presence, but on the presence of the love of God in the life of our community. And that love is always present where Jesus' commandments are being followed. And when that love is present and in those circumstances and in those communities, we find when that love is, is present, we find the peace of God that passes understanding in the midst of troubles. But when it's not present, we find ourselves with hospitals full of emotionally exhausted people. I've always witnessed that. 21 years as a chaplain, I was always say we could shut down 
well, there was two hospitals in, in Parkersburg. I said, we could shut down three floors of this one and that whole hospital if we, this is not my term, Dr. John Schindler noted a few years back that out of 500 people admitted to the clinic, 77% were suffering emotionally, which is about the percentage of the hospital beds I, we could get rid of in Parkersburg if people were not, ha were not full of what he called CDTs. He called them CDTs, cares, difficulties, and troubles of life. In junior high, I remember, I remember studying the first man to cross the Atlantic and into the Pacific, around, around the, the Cape of South America. It was a very trying and difficult experience, full of bad weather and rough seas. And for about a year, this passage was underway to get around the tip of South America by 1520. His name was Ferdinand Magellan. Most of you guys remember that name. His crew was about to mutiny. He was full of CDTs. He had cares, he had cares and difficulties and troubles in life, and he was full of those things. And, his, and, and when, he, when he finally reached that new body of water, he finally reached that Pacific Ocean. He named it Pacific because Pacific means peaceful. And he and his men, they lifted their heads and gave thanks to God. Wouldn't it be sweet to drop anchor in the sea of peace? Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be sweet in our personal lives to find that sea of tranquility, that sea called peace, and anchor our hearts and our souls there? You see, that's exactly what the gospel is meant for us. That's what the gospel is offering us this morning. Jesus is saying, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives it to you, let not your hearts be troubled, church. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You see, Jesus knew he was facing some very rough times. They were just ahead. And in the, in, and in the midst of all of those struggles, Jesus is saying, let peace abide. Let peace cover our lives in the midst of those troubles. So the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, comes on the scene. When Jesus leaves, the Comforter comes. And now we're able to, to recognize that scene as, as, as the, the God of, of the Comforter begins to come into our lives. Our fears are diminished when we trust and obey and we're about what God has called us to be about. He's called each of us into ministry in the kingdom of God. He's given us the authority and the power, great power, that all forces seek to destroy us. We have power over all the things that, that try to divert our attention away from the kingdom of God. I understand we're fearful. I understand as the storms beat against our lives and the storms rage around us, but God is saying to us that we walk out into the abyss, the darkness of tomorrow without any clue what might happen tomorrow. But I walk out of, into the abyss of tomorrow with God's unchanging hand. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So in his farewell text, Jesus is performing his last pastoral duty by preparing his disciples for his departure. He's preparing to go to the cross. And Jesus is assuring them that they will not be orphaned, but that they will, be, that they will have a comforter come among them. And they'll be able to continue his ministry just as he had started. The disciples, however, are full of despair. They're full of fear. They're afraid they're going to be left alone. So you see the bigger picture here is that we're, we, we must deal with our fears and anxieties. But pointing to the triumph of the, of the God of the universe as the ruler of our lives, that's the bigger picture. That those anxieties can be dealt with, with the Spirit of God. That the love of God that, that Jesus is demonstrating will win out every time. The power, I think sometimes it don't roll off my tongue as it should to tie love in with power. But I've come to realize that the greatest power and force in the world is the power of the love of God and the grace of God. And when they're coupled together, there's no force on the earth that can deal with that. A future that's grounded in the resurrection life of Jesus Christ that they'll soon experience. 
So Jesus is offering a life of hope in the midst of despair. It was just last week that we celebrated the life and resurrection of Dr. Bob in this place. The life and resurrection of Pam Cross. And in both cases, without the resurrection hope of Jesus that Jesus is offering in these events that we're speaking of this morning, without that, it would have been a miserable and unbearable experience. But it wasn't. It was an experience of hope and resurrection. Jesus has offered us the promises, the future that's founded in the immutable Word of God. You see how sweet it is to, to, to understand that God is all what God is offering us in Christ over and over. John, in John 14, Jesus is assuring his disciples that they will not face the future alone, but through the gift of God. That even though and even after Jesus perishes on the cross, that they will not be alone, but will continue under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that works within the hearts of men and women to this day. And they'll be given the power to live out the commandments of God in the same way. Jesus is reminding us of the awesome power of the love of God. Maybe it's hard to think of it in that way. But love is power and a great force. I believe Jesus is telling us, Jesus is telling us to walk out in faith and hope even when the circumstances of our lives look very different than that. Jesus is facing the cross. He knows that death, he knows that death is going to claim his life. And Jesus is telling his disciples that even when the battle looks like it's lost, know that God is still in control. He gives us the renewed hope. Do not let your hearts be troubled, church. Neither let them be afraid. You see, I believe Jesus' goal here is to let his, let his disciples know that, that, in, that their lives should not be shaped by the absence of Jesus, but by the presence of God in their lives. That hope might become despair. That hope will overcome despair. And God's presence will lead into the future with a glorious expectation of God's kingdom being fulfilled in the midst of our lives. If you love me, follow my commandments. And that great commandment of following God and loving God and allowing the love of God to minister to those that are hurting, to the least and the last and the lost in our midst. I always say that when you're ministering to people, you've got to love people and get your hands dirty. That means you're out in the midst of the trouble. You're out in the midst of where they are. When Jesus is your Lord, you're conscious of all that God wants in the, glory, in the glorious kingdom. Thus, you'll be a child of God, operating with the love of God, and have dirty hands as you seek out those that are hurting in our world. We're called to action, church. We're called to action, and we have all the tools necessary to bring great glory to the kingdom of God. So I end with these words this morning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Grace and peace God offers to us. And that's enough. In Jesus' name.